Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. In fact, good day to all my dear friends of I am Udaipur and its well-wishers. We have a global audience today and I take this opportunity to thank each one of you for attending the 10th anniversary celebrations of I am Udaipur. I'm your host for the day and my name is Y Shaker. I'm associated with the Center for Digital Enterprise, a center that intends to develop management concepts and perspectives through the lens of digital. In that sense, we are dedicated towards developing managerial and leadership talents for the digital world. And therefore, on behalf of I am Udaipur, it's my deep honor and privilege to welcome you all to this pioneering online event titled Dev Future. We will be having two evenings of very thought-provoking talks by eminent professors and international authors from Harvard Business School and Boston College, along with panel discussions of industry professionals from across the globe. Interestingly, it is digital technology itself that is enabling us to connect live. Today, we'll be joined by Dr. Sunil Gupta of Harvard Business School to address us, followed by a panel discussion with leading industry professionals from India and Singapore. We start today's proceedings with an inaugural address by Professor Janat Shah, the founding director of I am Udaipur. It's my privilege to introduce Professor Janat Shah to uh, the audience here. Professor Shah has over three decades of teaching experience in leading management schools, where he shaped minds and molded careers of several business leaders of today. His commitment to teaching and an endearing personality have won him deep admirers and long-standing friends from the academia and the industry. He teaches operations management and supply chain, where he commands authority, and is the author of the book, Supply Chain Management, Text and Cases. This book is extensively used in MBA and executive MBA courses. He has also published extensively in national and international journals on this subject. Professor Shah, was a visiting scholar at Sloan School of Management, MIT, a visiting faculty with the Logistics Institute of National University, Singapore, president of Society of Operations Management, India, and currently holds a position of special professor at Nottingham University. It's my honor and privilege to invite Professor Shah to address us. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of AMU community, I extend warm welcome to today's event. My sincere gratitude goes out to Dr. Sunil Gupta, Professor of Business Administration, Harvard Business School, for accepting our invitation to deliver the keynote address at today's The Future event. His book, on driving digital strategy, a guide to reimagining your business is indeed a must read for anyone who wishes to understand the digital phenomenon and how business could leverage the disruption to a strategic advantage. Despite the time difference, we'll hear him live from US and we're grateful to him for accommodating this request. I would also like to thank Vidisha Nagaraj, Kavita Chaturvedi, and Simon Thomas for being a part of panel discussion on digital transformation, which follows Dr. Gupta's address. I'm also grateful to Professor Srinivas Pingali for moderating the event. So Pingali is a faculty in business policy and strategy with Ayam Udaipur and has written two books on digital transformation. This is indeed a very important occasion for us as it embodies the decade anniversary of Ayamudaipur having been founded in 2011. It is a great feeling when a second generation I am like us completes a decade. For us though, it's just one landmark in our vision to build Ayamudaipur as a global management institution of repute. I'm happy to note that during this 10 years, Amudaipur has added several distinctions to itself in this process. 
you became only the fourth i am and the youngest institute in the world to be a part of a prestigious ft global mif top 100 rankings you were actually only the third i am amongst the i am ahmedabad and bangalore to be in this ranking for third consecutive year we similarly became the youngest b school in the world along with the sydney business school to be a part of the equally prestigious qs world mm rankings we are again in the rankings for the third consecutive year we are also only the youngest i am to got the world recognized assb accreditation it puts us alongside just 5% of the world business schools that are recognized by this accreditation our focus on high quality research has led us to be ranked fourth in india by ut dallas methodology for several years of now we took the initiative of establishing centers for excellence in digital enterprise management and global supply chain management and now have extended this effort to healthcare and fintech last year we became first b school in the country to our consumer culture lab the lab is already taking many initiatives including a first time survey for understanding the digital landscape of rural india the strong foundation and achievements that we have built in the last 10 years have put us alongside iams and b schools established much earlier and ahead of many others however this remain just reassuring milestones that establish how we doing on the road to becoming among the leading management institution in the world by 2030 meaningful growth and innovations are in the dna of iim udaipur in 2019 iim's board led the vision 2030 the visioning exercise involved all of our stakeholders identifying trem premier global business schools which will be our benchmark till 2030 in the future we will continue to focus on high quality research and student transformation journey additionally we would invest in building stronger bonds with our corporate partners last year the institute had set up a fight task forces with focus on enhance research productivity improve quality of learning improve placement outcomes establishing a source of distinctiveness for the institute and expand avenues of funding this task forces involved board members faculty staff students and alumni the task forces have worked on a detailed plan which would help imu achieve the ambitious vision 2030 i'm pleased to share that now we have a vision owned by our institute board faculty alumni and staff let me just illustrate ambitious nature of our vision by sharing with you our 2030 goals on research front for instance even though we are consistently in the top 4 in research in india our vision is to be in ut dallas top 100 list and for your information we do not have a single school from india in that list right now we have a similar ambition on education front also as a institute we are among the foremost to recognize the growing importance of digital technologies and how they are shaping businesses and economies at imu digital technology and customer centricity are core areas imu also wants to take a lead in the way management research and management education 
would be shaped by digital technologies. We want to ensure that we equip our students with management concepts and leadership styles required in the emerging digital business enterprises. It's imperative to rethink the fundamentals of leadership and strategy to leverage digital transformation. The rethinking motivated us to launch the India's first ever one-year MBA in digital enterprise management for experienced professionals. Subsequently, we also have introduced digital related courses in all our education programs. Our today's online event, Future, is another step in our effort to stimulate thought leadership in how the future is being digitalized and the lessons and opportunities for businesses. The event could not have been organized at a more opportunate moment on the forever disrupting digital business world. We hope the discussion benefit you. Is the vision with which the two evening event has been conceptualized and put together. I would like to acknowledge the efforts put in by the Ayam Udaipur team that has made the event possible. Even more importantly, I would like to acknowledge the immense contributions of all faculty, staff, alumni, students, service providers who helped build this great institution right from the days of its foundation and above all the vision and support of our governing board, the industry and recruiters as we complete 10 years. Without you, it would not have been possible. I once again welcome you all. I wish all of us a most enriching and impactful webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shah, for sharing your vision and the leadership that you have given to IIM Udaipur. The Institute IIM Udaipur has several unique distinctions and achievements and has set a culture for some great research and educational endeavors to happen here. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, we now wish to capture the spirit of IMU in a short video that we will play, which marks our 10th anniversary. Thank you for playing the video. Uh, as we uh, wait for Professor Gupta to join us, uh, we'll take a moment's break.
Welcome back, friends. Uh, Professor Gupta is here with us, and it's my honor and privilege to introduce him, who actually doesn't require much of an introduction. Nonetheless, I've been tasked to do it, and it's my privilege to do that. Professor Gupta is the Edward W. Carter Professor of Business Administration and co-chair of the Executive Program on Digital uh, Strategy at the Harvard Business School. He was chair of the general management program from 2013 to 2019. From August 2019 to February 2020, he served as a senior advisor to the CEO of Cleveland Clinic to help him design their digital strategy. Professor Gupta's current research is in the area of digital technology and its impact on consumer behavior and firm strategy. The primary goal of his research is to understand how entrepreneurs can leverage digital technology to disrupting existing industries and how incumbents should transform their business in this new environment. His book on this topic, Driving Digital Strategy, was published by Harvard Business Review Press in August <clears throat> 2018. Professor Gupta's previous research focused on customer management, pricing, digital marketing, and return on marketing investment. His book, Managing Customers as Investments, won the 2006 Berry AMA Award. Professor Gupta has published three books and over 120 articles, book chapters, cases, notes on these topics. His research has been well recognized and articles have won several national and international awards. For the last six years, that's between 2016 and 2021, he has been invited by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences to nominate a scholar for the Nobel Prize in Economics. Professor Gupta serves on the board of US Foods and as an advisor to several startup firms. He has conducted seminars and consulted many leading companies around the world. As a business expert, he has frequently appeared on several national and international television programs, such as CBS, CNN, NPR, and BBC. And he has been quoted in Forbes, The Fast Company, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. Professor Gupta is an alumnus of Indian Institute of Technology in Mechanical Engineering, followed by an MBA in, from IIM uh, Ahmedabad. He's also a PhD from the Boston University. I now welcome Professor Gupta to address our audience. Dr. Shekhar, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a true pleasure and honor to be here as an alum of uh, one of the IIMs. And first of all, let me congratulate all of you on your 10th anniversary. You've done a phenomenal job in a, such a short period of time, and I wish you all the very best. Uh, so let me just share my slides. Uh, hopefully all of you can see that. Uh, and this has been a journey that I've gone through for the last 12 years, uh, because technology is affecting all of us in one form or the other. Uh, and also every company is worried about how technology may shape their future. So in the last 12 years, I must have talked to over 200 companies all around the world, uh, including many in India. And these companies broadly fall into three categories. So first group of companies I talked to are the startups and the VCs who are funding them, just to understand how they are disrupting existing businesses. So for example, in India, I talked to Vijay Shekhar Sharma of Paytm, Ritesh Agarwal of Oyo, and the Bunsels of Flipkart. Uh, how do they build this such a large company and change the environment in their in own industries? The second group of companies I talked to are what I call digital giants. These are the Amazons, the Apples of the world, who started as a small startup in a digital way, but now they become large companies and they have to manage both their digital DNA and how, how do you actually handle a large organization with thousands of employees? And the third group of companies I talk to are the large legacy companies, the General Electric, the General Motors of the world, who are also now have to navigate this new world. And it's much harder to change this large ship uh, of a legacy business. So I'll share with you some of my learnings from all three groups. Uh, and the, one of the first questions I all these companies is, 
as you see this digital technology affecting every business, what is your digital strategy? What are you doing as a result of that? And the answers I got fall into three categories. The first approach that many companies take is what I call digital optimization. What that means is I use technology to cut cost, improve efficiency, make my processes better and faster. So whether it's AI or any other technology I use. And that's great. You should always reduce cost and improve efficiency. So if you're a bank, you might shut down the physical branches and do mobile banking. Fantastic, great idea. But I would argue if that's all you're doing, you might be the most efficient but most irrelevant bank in the future because Amazon may get into banking and some other players may get into banking. So cost cutting and efficiency improvement is a necessary step, but that's not enough for the future because the future may be very different. The second approach people take is a bunch of experiments. And the idea here is that I don't know what the future will be. Future is very uncertain. So let me do a whole lot of experiments. So as you see, many companies have hackathons and all the digital days where they inspire their employees to look for new ways to operate their business using technology. Again, great idea. You should always do experiments to learn. But the reality in most companies is suddenly you have hundreds or perhaps thousands of experiments happening inside a large company, which don't add up to anything. So as an example, many years ago, I talked to Casper Rostead, who that time was the CEO of Henkel, and now he's the CEO of Adidas. And Casper said when he became the CEO, he asked his team to do an audit of all the digital experiments going inside the company. And the team stopped counting after 200. In other words, there was a lot of excitement, but there was no progress because these small, small experiments didn't add up to the strategic direction of the company. The third approach companies say is, if I, especially if I'm a large organization, it's very hard to do innovation in a large company because the bureaucracy and the white blood cells come out to just kill any innovation that uh, somebody is trying to come up with. So what these companies end up doing is they say, I'm gonna create a separate unit, hire a bunch of smart MBAs, give them a few million dollars and send them to California. And hopefully good things will happen. And how's that? Yes. This yes. is fine. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. So the third approach I was talking about was using uh, these independent units, which people send to California. And, and, and again, the, the problem there is if you're trying to turn a large ship by launching this separate unit, you've effectively launched a speedboat. And usually what happens, the speedboat takes off, but the ship doesn't move. So all these three approaches are fine but they really don't have a major impact on the business. So the question that sort of I struggle with, and that's part of my research in the last 12 years is, how do you do this major transformation in a large organization? And I think what you really need to do is two things at the same time. You're a large ship, so you have to change the, en or, or you're a large plane, you have to change the engine of a plane while flying. So you have to strengthen the core of your business, but also build for the future at the same time. And in order to do that, you have to do multiple things simultaneously. You have to think about your business strategy differently. You have to think about your operations differently. You have to think about how you engage with the customers differently. And you have to organization wise also, it has to be structured differently. So in the talk today, I'm going to focus on the business strategy part because we have a limited time. And what I want to share with you are three things. One is have the rules of strategy fundamentally changed. Uh, in other words, what I learned in my MBA back many years ago, are those rules still apply or have the fundamental rules changed? The second thing I want to talk about is how do we get new customer insights that drive our business? And of course, technology is in the background, but you don't start with technology, you start with consumer behavior. And the third is how do you find new opportunities for growth? And the way I'm going to talk about these is I'm going to use some mini case studies uh, to highlight these examples. Um, so let me start with a company that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, which is Amazon. And as you know, Amazon started many years ago in 1995 by selling books and electronics, and it became uh, a competition for all the brick and mortar stores. And the, the key value proposition of Amazon was that I'm cheaper because I don't have brick and mortar stores. It's convenient. You don't have to fight the traffic. And third, I have infinite variety because I don't have the shelf space limitation of a physical store. So Amazon became a great online store, but that's not where it stopped. 
Very soon, it became a marketplace. Now, what is a marketplace? Marketplace is one where Amazon invited third-party sellers, you and me, to sell on Amazon's platform. Now, notice Walmart doesn't allow you to set up a shop within Walmart, but Amazon is allowing us to set up a shop on Amazon's platform. Now, why is Amazon doing it? Lots of benefits, but perhaps the most important benefit for creating a marketplace is uh, as more, uh, so going back to my Amazon story, uh, I guess uh, what we are talking about is uh, <clears throat> the benefit of marketplace is as more sellers come on marketplace, more customers come, as more customers come, more sellers come, and they suddenly become a winner take all market. In other words, we are talking about network effects. You're connecting buyers and connecting sellers. More buyers mean more sellers, more sellers mean more buyers, and suddenly that becomes a winner take all market. Uh, Amazon straight away went into AWS, and suddenly now you have a very different competition from IBM and Microsoft and Google. And you sort of say, why is Amazon going from a B2C company to a B2B company? A very different competition, very different customer base. And again, the reason was very simple. Amazon started AWS not because they wanted to go into that business. They started AWS because to help their existing customers, the third-party sellers, who didn't know how to do business on e-commerce on Amazon's platform, so they created a platform on which they built APIs where third-party sellers could plug and play. In other words, AWS came from solving their existing customer's problem. And once Amazon built that muscle, they say, hey, we can launch a new business. You can go on. Kindle was launched uh, long before iPad. And of course, Kindle became a competition to Apple and Samsung. Why is an online retailer getting into hardware production? Well, the answer is very simple. As many of you move from buying physical books to digital books, Amazon is helping you download the eBooks on Kindle. In other words, Kindle is the razor to sell books, the blades. So purpose of Kindle is not to make money on Kindle itself. Purpose of Kindle is to make money on the books. So you can keep going on this whole process. And perhaps the most strange thing that Amazon did is build its own studio and make its own movies. Remember, Amazon was an online retailer. And you say, why is an online retailer making movies? Why are they competing with Hollywood? Walmart does not make movies. A department store like Reliance does not make movies. Well, maybe Reliance does make movies because that's, that's a different story. But lots of stores, a lot of retail stores don't make movies. So the question is, why are they making movies? And when I talk to executives, many say, well, this is to collect data. Well, every company wants to collect data. So should every company got into, get into making movies? It just doesn't make sense. And I think the, if you think through as to what is the purpose of Amazon getting into Amazon Studio, the answer is Prime, Amazon Prime. Now, if you remember, Amazon Prime started in the US where Amazon offers two-day free shipping for $79. Now, many of the customers like you are smart and all of you will do this mental math in your head and say, how many shipments do I expect next year? And is $79 worth it or not? And many of you may conclude, well, I'm not sure, let's not sign up for Amazon Prime. Jeff Bezos does not want you to do this math. So what does he do? He throws in some free content of movies and music and now you can't do this calculation. Now, why is Amazon Prime so important for Amazon? Right now, Amazon has 200 million customers of Amazon Prime globally. If on an average they pay about $100 per year because it varies by countries, that's $20 billion in my pocket even before I start my open my shop. Number two, the research shows Amazon Prime customers buy three to four times more than the non-Prime customers. And the third, perhaps the most important, is Prime customers are not even price, price sensitive. So, in fact, Jeff Bezos has gone to publicly say that every time we win a Golden Globe Award for one of our shows, people buy more shoes. So what are movies? Movies is another razor in order to keep you loyal to my prime customer so that you buy more on my e-commerce platform. So the purpose of movies is not to make money, just like Kindle is not making money. The purpose of movies is to keep you as a prime customer in order to uh, get you buy more from the e-commerce. I won't go into all the other details, but the reason I'm highlighting this is to say, what is the lesson that we learn from Amazon? And I think the lesson is 
the fundamental rules of strategy have changed. So when I was in the MBA program, I was taught that the way to win in the market and the way to gain competitive advantage is to be better or cheaper, product differentiation or cost leadership. And that makes a lot of sense if you are selling one product to one customer. I'm selling you my car, my car is better or my car is cheaper. But what happens if I'm selling multiple products to the same customer? That's when you have razor and blade. I sell you Kindle cheap in order to make money on the eBooks. Now you might say razor and blade have been around forever. What's new today? And I would argue what is new today is razor could be in one industry and blade could be in a completely different industry. Razor could be movies, blade could be shoes. Think about it for a moment. If Amazon wants to get into banking, how can Amazon make it difficult for banks to compete? And I would argue what Amazon can do is they can offer loans to SMEs at a, such a low rate that banks could never match that. And why would Amazon do that? Because Amazon can say, I don't have to make that much money on the loans. I will make money when these SMEs grow and I get higher commission on my platform. The moment you make somebody's core business your razor, they can't compete. On the other dimension is where you have selling the same product to multiple customers. That's when you have the network effects. So think about Facebook or WhatsApp. If you are the only customer in the world using WhatsApp or Facebook, what's the value of that? Zero, unless you love yourself. Now, as more and more people get onto that platform, the value of Facebook or WhatsApp increases without changing the product. In other words, it's not about product. So network effects is about connecting customers, Razor and Blade is about connecting products. Digital economy is all about connections. It's not about products. And of course, the ideal thing is to connect both. That's what WeChat started with as a platform for connecting customers, free service. And then on top of that, you build the other services. Now, when I talk to executives about this, they say, this is fine for Amazon and all the tech companies, but I'm not a technology company. How do these principles apply if I'm not a technology company? So let me give you some example of traditional businesses that can learn from this particular Amazon strategy. So let's take the example of a company, US Food. This is a large distributor of food products. It's a $27 billion company in the US and think of them as wholesalers. They buy food from suppliers, put it in their warehouses and sell to independent restaurants. I know something about this company because I'm on their board. So how was this company competing in the marketplace? They will go to the restaurants and they say, my fish is better or my fish is cheaper. Traditional way of creating competitive advantage. This is what we have learned, right? Now, of course, as you can imagine, what will the competition say? The same thing, my fish is better or my fish is cheaper. Over time, what happens is the quality of fish roughly becomes the same and then it becomes a price pressure and margins erode. That happens to every company. So the question we asked is, how do we learn from Amazon to change the game? And the question that we asked ourselves is, what is the, how do we create a razor for fish? And my CEO said, you gotta be crazy. What do you mean razor for fish? That doesn't make sense. But the trick in this is to put, forget about your product and put yourself in the shoes of the customer. So if you put yourself in the shoes of an independent restaurant owner, and think about it, what keeps that restaurant owner up at night? You don't have to know market research to know that majority of restaurants go out of business every year. And this is before even the pandemic. And the reason is these independent restaurants are started by mom and pop operations, people who love food, who love cooking, but they don't know much about business. So they're worried whether they will be in business tomorrow. They don't know how to price the menu. They don't know how to manage inventory. They don't know how to manage labor. They don't know how to manage cash flow. All those issues which are required for running a successful small business. They don't know how to cook, but they don't know other parts of the business. Once we recognize that, that that's the key problem of the customer, not the price of the fish, then the company started making software. And some of the software was made by the company. Some was uh, subcontracted from third party and given at a subsidized price. Now think about it, what is a wholesale distribution company doing in making software, but that's my razor. I'm trying to solve the customer's problem 
And the moment I offer these services to these restaurants, the conversation shifts from the price of fish. And our research with these customers show that the customers who use these services uh, no longer are actually have higher basket size, much higher retention, and also less price sensitive. And how do I create network effects like Amazon? Well, it's a very fragmented market of supplies, food supplies on one side and restaurants on the other side. And I can again create a platform just like network to connect the customers and suppliers. Another example of that is Peloton, which is uh, the exercise bike, expensive exercise bike. And again, the traditional strategy for competitive advantage for this product could have been my bike is better. It's expensive, but my bike is better. The founder of this company had a good insight and they said, when people come back from the gym, nobody talks about the equipment. They talk about their routine, they talk about their instruction, they talk about the other people in the gym, not about the product. And we are talking about our product. That doesn't make sense. Now, people who buy these bikes, they want to exercise at home because for whatever reason, they can't go to the gym. So what they miss is the environment of the gym. So how do I create the environment of the gym inside your home to get you in that competitive mode? So instead of focusing on the product, they started creating these compliments, these videos on demand, where you can actually have an instructor on demand and do the exercise with that instructor because that is the value added. And as the more and more people buy Peloton, they started creating this network of Peloton riders. So if I want to get on my Peloton at 6 a.m. in the morning in Boston, I can in real time connect with hundreds of other customers of Peloton who may be biking in India and Australia and New Zealand and other places. And this is my virtual gym in my home. And when I see other people biking at the same time in real time, I get much more competitive and I start pedaling faster. Now, what is the benefit of all that? That if tomorrow a competitor comes with a better bike, it doesn't matter because as a Peloton customer, I'm not moving because I have all the other Peloton riders in my network that I will miss if I move to another product. So I think the fundamental rules of the strategy today is, yes, a good product is important. That's a necessary condition, but the competition catches up on the product very quickly. An Apple phone and a Samsung phone become very similar after a point in time. And the reason why I still use an iPhone is because my kids have the same phone and I can do FaceTime with them. And that's the value added, not the quality of the phone itself, the connection itself, right? So the rules of strategy, I would say, is about connecting products and connecting customers. Let me move on to the second topic of getting new insights. How do you get new insights that drive your business? So take the example of a Japanese company, Komatsu. This is the company that makes heavy construction equipment like diggers and, and, and other bulldozers, et cetera. And what they've been doing was they were been putting sensors into their products, the IoT, so to speak, to make sure they can do remote maintenance even before the product, the equipment goes down, it needs maintenance, I can fix it so that there is no downtime at the construction site, right? Makes a lot of sense. But then they realized some of the executives went to a construction site. And in this case, the construction site was a highway construction going on. And they saw their equipment sitting idle. And they said, that doesn't make sense because we put all the sensors in the equipment to reduce downtime. So why is that equipment sitting idle? Uh, because it's not being productive and that's not good for the customer. Once they investigated further, they found that the construction site uh, people had not designed or planned properly to get enough dump trucks on the site. So the Komatsu truck bulldozer was digging enough dirt, but there were no dump trucks to put the dirt in. Now, why didn't they plan that? Because they couldn't figure out as to the topography of the, of the particular area to figure out how much dirt will come out and therefore how many dump trucks will remain. So even, and so then they've started mapping the customer journey and they found that their own product is involved in only two out of the seven steps. In other words, even if you make your product extremely good, it doesn't matter because five out of seven steps may be still inefficient. So then they started thinking about, okay, what can we do as a company about the entire customer journey and not only about the product? 
So they started a, a digital command center. They had drones. They did the aerial uh, sort of a survey of the site. Based on the aerial survey of the site, they create 3D images of the site to figure out as to how the construction project will go. So the construction company can plan accordingly and think about how much dirt will come out, what the obstacles might be, et cetera, et cetera. And that has become a huge service and a huge revenue source for the company and not just the product. Again, you're solving a customer problem, but in the process expands the scope of your business. Same thing happened with uh, DBS Bank in Singapore. So Piyush Gupta, who actually happened to be one year junior for me uh, and in my IM, uh, he's now the CEO of DBS Bank in Singapore. And when I talked to Piyush, he basically told me that like any bank, his team was thinking of building an app for mortgage. And what they ended up doing was they said, we'll map the customer journey and figure out as to how to reduce friction when consumers apply for mortgage. So the mortgage process is faster, approval process is faster, they get the feedback very quick. And Piyush stopped them and said, no, that's simply looking from our bank's point of view. No customer gets up in the morning getting excited about mortgage. What they're excited about is excited about buying a house, not buying the mortgage. So let's think beyond our product. So what they ended up doing was they ended up integrating the town data in Singapore with their app. So now imagine I'm a potential buyer looking for a house in Singapore. I, I see some house that I like. I take out my mobile phone. I've downloaded the DBS app. I put the mobile phone in front of the house. The image of the house connects me to the town data. And I know everything about that particular house. What was the previous transaction prices? What is the energy bill, et cetera? I also know where are the closest train stations, grocery stores, schools, all the things as a potential buyer, I want to know before I decide whether I want to buy the house or not. Okay. Once you would like a particular house, you might want to find out, can I afford it? And of course, there's a mortgage calculator to say what will be the monthly payments. In other words, customer is already into this journey before they think about mortgage. And as a result, what they found is by building this particular app, their share of the mortgage has increased dramatically. So again, thinking beyond your products, and of course, there is technology behind all this, but technology comes later. You start with the customer insight. And let me go to the, finally the third part, which is how to find new opportunities for growth. And I think in this, perhaps the best lesson you can learn from for what Jeff Bezos says, which is work backwards, scale forward. What does that mean? What that means is you work backwards to solve a customer's problem. And in in the process of solving a customer's problem, you may require to build new skills. And once you build that muscle, you use that muscle to launch a completely new business. So work backwards to solve a customer's problem. If it requires you to build a new skill, build that skill and take that skill forward to launch a completely new business. So here are a few examples. When Amazon started as an online retailer, which we saw recently, it then went into marketplace because it says there are network effects. I want to bring the third party sellers. And as I already mentioned, in order to help the third party sellers who didn't know e-commerce, they developed a platform, which they later on built into a completely new business called AWS. Take another example. When Amazon built this marketplace, they invited thousands of sellers or millions of sellers onto this marketplace. But now I have another problem for customers the customers can't find the item they're looking for because it's an endless aisle. There are millions of products in the shop. How do you find the product that you're looking for? So as a result, Amazon needed to build a search algorithm so that when you go to Amazon site, you can search for any product you want and it comes very quickly. But the, so in other words, I'm building the search algorithm to help my customers. But once I build this muscle, what can I do? I can go into advertising. And now Amazon is the largest competitor, one of the largest competitors to Google. And Amazon did not start by thinking, let's compete with Google. Let's get into advertising business. That was not the starting point. The starting point was to help solve the customer's problem. And in the process, I have developed this capability and then launched a new business. Take another example. 
warehousing is a big part of Amazon's business, right? So clearly, they need to be much more efficient in their warehousing process. And as a result of that warehousing, they built this technology called computer vision, where there are cameras in all over the warehouse uh, to figure out where the products are. And then they have the robots Kiva system that pulls out the product that then pack it and ship to your home. In other words, the computer vision technology was developed to solve their own problem. In this case, they were their own customers to solve the problem of warehousing and logistics. But once they built that muscle, Amazon is now testing the Amazon Go store that many of you are probably familiar with. These are small stores with no people inside. So as if you're an Amazon Prime customer, you walk into the store, everybody has a smartphone these days, the computers, uh, uh, the, the videos and uh, cameras in the store recognize you with the face recognition technology. They match you with the Amazon Prime's database. Uh, so they know that is, this is Professor Janath Shah that who's walked in the store. Professor Shah picks up an item, walks out. There is no human interaction whatsoever. And his credit card is automatically charged on Amazon Prime. If he wants to return an item, he walks into the store, puts an item in the shelf, walks out, no problem whatsoever. In other words, they, they're trying to make the physical store buying process completely frictionless. This, in my opinion, will be the AWS of physical retail. Amazon will use this technology to share that with all the retail stores in the world, which is a trillion dollar market, and will open up a new, completely new business for Amazon. And they're already testing with 20, 30 different stores in the US. Uh, and I'm pretty sure this will be a huge new opportunity for Amazon. And again, Amazon did not start thinking as to how do we revolutionize physical retail. They started by building the muscle for their own. And, but then they had the foresight and say, where else can this skill be used outside of our main business? Here is another example of Alibaba. As many of you know, Alibaba started with Taobao, which is the buyers and sellers meet to share, uh, to sell their secondhand items. The problem that Taobao found was the buyers and sellers didn't trust each other. So if I'm a buyer and I, you are selling me an iPhone, how do I know I'm gonna get an iPhone and not a bar of soap? So in order to create that trust, they created an escrow account that the buyer does not pay the seller. They put the money in an escrow account with Alibaba. And only when they receive the right product, the money is released from the escrow account to the seller. In other words, Alibaba learned this skill to help the customers transact on Taobao. But the moment I learned how to manage money, what can I do? Well, now Alibaba is one of the largest wealth managers in the world because I learned that from, from that particular skill. So this notion of working backwards to create a skill and then le leveraging that skill to completely new business, I've seen in not only in technology business, but also in many other businesses. An example of that is uh, MasterCard. So uh, Ajay Banga, when he became CEO in 2010, and again, he happened to be one of my classmates from IAM, and uh, he uh, was a CEO for 10 years and now retiring as a chairman. When he came as, became the CEO, he found that cyber, as of course, MasterCard's business is dealing with all kinds of data, consumers' data of transactions, and as the cybersecurity threat becomes more and more for, uh, visible for every company, they needed to create cybersecurity skills to protect their own data and their own customers. In other words, they created this muscle and skills to create benefit for their own customers. But once they build that skill, they say, hey, we have learned this capability of cybersecurity. Lots of our bank customers need that as well. Lots of other people need cybersecurity skills. So now cybersecurity has become a service that MasterCard provides to lots of other customers. And when Ajay became the CEO in 2010, services was less than 5% of their total revenue. Today is 35% of their total revenue. And now all this happened because they developed the skills by solving their customer's problem and then leveraging their skills to completely launch a new business. So let me just leave you with those three messages. And again, there are lots of other things I can talk about. One is if you think about the rules of business have changed, which is 
connect products and connect customers, not focus only on the product. The second is think of the new insights, start with the customers, forget about your product for a moment. And the third is work backwards and scale forward. Um, so with that, let me sort of pause here and take any questions that people may have. I'll stop sharing my screen here. Thank you, Professor Gupta, uh, for the uh, enlightening talk. Uh, we have several questions, uh, and uh, I'll, a lot of questions are about what you talked about Amazon, so I'll start with that. So the questions are largely saying that as companies move from pipeline to platforms, uh, are they losing focus? Because traditionally, we've been told that you know, companies need to focus. So how do companies manage this apparent loss of focus as they move into platform strategies? That's a very good question. And I remember when I was in the MBA program also, I was told strategies about focus. And I sort of joked that if you look at Amazon, it looks like Jeff Bezos missed that class because certainly that doesn't look like focus. It's all over the place. But I think when we talk about focus, we, talk, we typically think in terms of industry-wise. So if I'm a bank, I stay in banking. If I'm a retailer, I stay in retailing, right? That seems like a focus. But I don't think we should think of focus that way. We should think of focus from the capabilities. That if I, I stay within my capability zone and I, sometimes I've developed new capabilities, that's okay. So if you think about the capabilities, Amazon, I would argue has three capabilities. The first capability is certainly technology, that they are a technology player and they can, that's why they're in AWS, they build computer vision, they build all kinds of things. The second is logistics. They have a huge logistics capability, better than Federal Express and UPS. And the third is data and customer knowledge. Uh, in fact, now Amazon has uh, created these uh, one hour delivery services in many parts of the, uh, the world. Uh, why? Because they know what I'm going to buy even before I know what I'm going to buy. And they put the warehouses and products close to me. Anything that touches these three capabilities, as Amazon, I will do. So I will not make cream cheese. I will not, not make aeroplanes because that is, does not fit with my capability. So I think I will think of focus from the capability point of view rather than from an industry point of view. Great. Uh, no, that's, uh, uh, that's great. I guess even as faculty, that's something we struggle with because we start teaching traditional strategy and then talk about Amazon and it confuses a lot of students in terms <laughs> of what we're trying to say. Uh, a couple of other questions, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. So the, another question is, uh, you know, we have a traditional business and then uh, we also need to get into a digital business. So how do we manage the conflict between these two? That's, uh, that's a question from the audience. Yeah, so that's always a challenge. And as that's what I say, you need to uh, change the engine of a plane while flying. Uh, and I think that, that, that sometimes there's a threat of cannibalization. So for example, when New York Times was thinking about the digital transition, they were worried if I give the online version for free, it will cut it cut into the physical paper. But a lot of companies have realized you can't fight the tidal wave. You have to leave a name. So again, if I give the example of MasterCard again, MasterCard is worried that many of the central banks are thinking about central bank digital currency, right? India is doing that. China is thinking about that. Bahamas have already launched the digital currency. So imagine your salary comes into the digital wallet and then you take the digital wallet to pay to the retail store. If I'm MasterCard, I worry, hey, I'm gone. Why, do, why does the world need me? Because I'm disintermediated in the whole process, right? But that's not how MasterCard is thinking. They're saying, we got to lean in. We cannot fight the tidal wave of where it is happening. Now, if you think about central bank digital currency, the governments also need help because how will governments ensure there is KYC? How will governments ensure that there's no fraud? How will the governments ensure that there is cybersecurity? And we have those skills. So I think it's just your business needs to shift but you can't fight that. You can't fight the consumers. You can't fight the trend, and you need to sort of adapt to that. Uh, and sometimes self cannibalization is important uh, before somebody else does it. So I think it's a hard thing to do. I totally agree. And sometimes there's a sort of a balance in terms of how you maybe use the existing business as a cash cow to fund the growth of the other businesses. Uh, but of course, it varies by it, business varies by context. Uh, I don't think there's a simple answer to that question. 
thanks. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, oh, sorry, just let me grab these. So uh, I guess digital transformation is often confused with implementing digital technologies. Uh, how do we focus on customer-centric behaviors away from technology-centric behaviors? I guess the question is really relating to there's so much of pressure to be the next blockchain company or the next AI yeah. company. You know, yeah. How to not, or not get caught up in all of that? I think we all get fascinated by technology. And I remember lots of tech, uh, executives I talked to, I say the, exactly the same question. How do I use blockchain? I said, why do you want to use blockchain? Uh, it, it just makes no sense. You, gotta, you have to start by saying, what is the problem you're trying to solve? If you don't know what is the problem you're trying to solve, it doesn't matter. Technology is just a tool. Uh, so yes, we get caught up in blockchain, NFT, metaverse, you name it. I mean, there's a, always a new thing that will come up. So yes, you should be aware of technology. You should be aware of the possibilities of the technology, but you should always start with what is the problem that we are trying to solve or what are the new opportunities we are trying to capture? If you can't answer that question, it does not matter. And I think companies are becoming smarter about that. Everybody realizes technology is, is an enabler, but you don't start with that. So I will always, and the boardrooms and everywhere, I will always start by saying, okay, what is the problem we're trying to solve? If you can't answer that question, I don't care whether it's blockchain or NFT or, or good old paper and pencil. Uh, but are customers expecting you to, uh, companies to be at the cutting edge of technology, Dr. Gupta, and therefore from a signaling perspective, does it make sense to actually signal that you are doing something even if there's no immediate customer demand for some new technology? I think, I mean, you you might, in the, again, you think about what business are you in? Are you in the business of signaling you're at the cutting edge or are you the business of making money? Uh, and it's it's okay to sort of signal, but if the if the business does not perform well, your shareholders are not gonna like you, right? And, and invariably, you will end up using technology. It's just a question of what technology. It has to be the right technology that solves the customer's problem. Uh, and a lot of technology is in the background that customers don't even know. Right? The technology that happens in the background of Amazon, we don't even know. We just know that the product shows up at a doorstep. Most people don't know computer vision or keyword robotic system they're using. And it doesn't matter. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, that answered the question. Uh, 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 Dr. Gupta, a question specifically from your book where somebody is referring to landing docks and speedboats. Uh, and the question is that if the speedboat goes too far away and becomes a, a ship by itself, then what happens to the, uh, to the mothership? How, how, I mean. So, you know, I mean, for the long time, when I talk to many of the banks, a lot of banks are worried about all the fintechs trying to disrupt them. So many banks, whether it is Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, or others, they started investing in the fintechs. And the idea was, I don't know which fintech will become big. So let's start investing in the fintechs. So I invest in 25 fintechs. 24 may fail, but one may become big. But the problem with that is, even if one becomes big, if it's not connected to the mothership, it doesn't change your core business. So now the one FinTech that became big, you can sell it, but then you're playing a VC game, yeah. right? You're not really changing the core of how you operate. So unless there is a rope connected, and when I talk to the MasterCard guys, they use the word landing dock rather than a speedboat with this notion that the CEO of the company had to decide that I need to move this ship from going, instead of going north to northeast. That's what I need to decide as a CEO. And then I connect the, the speedboats in a strategic fashion that all these speedboats start moving me in the northeast direction. And I give them some rope so they can independently operate. But there is a rope connected to the mothership. They're not swimming in the ocean completely independent of me. And at the right time, I pull the rope so they can actually come back and change the culture of the key organization. Otherwise, they're completely separate organizations. Uh, and then you're playing a very different game rather than changing the core of your business. Great. So there needs to be some link back from the speedboat to the mothership in the right. some rope <laughs> connecting the Yeah, two. and IBM did the same thing under Lou Gerstner in terms of how you do the transition, right? So you need to make sure, and sometimes what they do is there has to be a line manager from the mothership who's actually sponsoring the project of the speedboat. Because otherwise the speedboat, I, I was on the 
uh, the uh, uh, in, a, in a Spanish uh, mobile company, uh, Telefonica created this so-called disruptive council, and I was invited to be part of disruptive council. And they created this separate unit in London, where they employed 300 people, and the London office looked like a Google office with with all these uh, foosballs and free food and everything else. And they were create, trying to create this speedboat of the exciting, employ all the technology people. And what happened was the London office will create these new interesting projects. They send it to Madrid. Madrid will say, oh, this is interesting. They send it to Brazil. And the Brazil CEO will say, what are you talking about? This, this is not our business. We are not in this business. And that project doesn't go anywhere. And after three years of that experimentation, Telefonica shut down its London office. So I think that unless there is a connection to the core of the business, the core business people say, these guys are playing with toys. They don't know our core business. It really doesn't move the needle. Thanks, thanks. Uh, a question I think which is very pertinent to India, maybe the US is out of this now, is that uh, says that we are still being funded by the government, we are a legacy company. Uh, there's a reluctance on digital transformation. So how can we usher in technologies and digital transformation in legacy organizations? So again, I mean, it's, a, it's a, both a challenge and an opportunity. So I remember talking to Nandan Nilkani about how he created the Aadhaar system for a billion people in India. And he, he made a very interesting comment. He said, look, if I were to build a highway, physical highway, it would have been impossible for me to do that because all these existing players will come for create obstruction. There is a temple here, there's a Gurdwara there, I can't build a road there or whatever it is, right? Nobody knew about technology. So as a result, I could build any digital highway because nobody knew anything about it. So sometimes when people don't know, they don't know how to actually create obstacles. So as a result, he was able to create something because people didn't even know what to object about. So I think I'm not saying that is always the case, but that might be an opportunity in many of the legacy business because they don't even know what technology may change the business. The other part I've seen in almost every company, and that's not only in India, is the biggest resistance to change in or any organization is the threat to your own job and own career. So if I have, as a professor, if I have used the Blackboard to teach for the last 30 years, and now you ask me to suddenly teach on Zoom, I'll be the first one to tell my dean why it's a terrible idea. Because I'm worried that I won't be as good and some young people will take my job. So the job of the organization is to help me reskill and get up to speed. Because otherwise there will always be resistance. And I think no person left behind kind of argument should be done uh, so that when British Petroleum uses the alternate energy, the guys who work in the traditional fossil fuel oil, they feel like a second children. They say, look, I provide 95% of the cash, but you always talk about the alternative energy. I mean, what am I, chop liver? So I think you need to also make sure that you give the, your love and affection and the reskilling to those guys so they don't feel that. Otherwise, there is uh, obvious re resistance. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, 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 just a few more questions, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, Capabilities to leverage, leverage technology to solve customer problems is a necessity. Uh, several of the examples that you spoke about are about large companies. So are smaller companies inherently, inherently disadvantaged in their ab ability to acquire these capabilities to make them future ready? I don't think so. I think, it's, again, if you are a SME, I think you might be actually, you might be both in an advantage or a disadvantage. Let me explain why. So think about it, a startup is very good in terms of agility, innovation, breaking the mold, right? But they don't have a lot of cash, they don't have a lot of customers, they don't have a lot of brand. Large companies, legacy companies have the resources, they have the brand, they have the customers, they have the technology, a lot of those things, but they are slow. A mid-sized companies could be in the sweet spot that they're not as slow as a large company, but they're also not completely unknown like a startup. Now, of course, you can do the flip side that they are neither fast nor the resources, but I think a smart small companies, I've seen many small companies, 
but you got to find your niche. You got to find your focus because you can't compete with large companies in the sky. So I think it's a very similar thing. And I've seen lots of small, medium-sized companies operate very, very effectively. Uh, and many of them built huge businesses on Amazon, for example. So you leverage a platform of the existing large technology companies uh, and build, because you can outsource lots of things these days using technology. Build a business on Shopify, build a business on Amazon, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a question that goes back to an earlier response in terms of you know whether technology comes first or customer comes first so there's an additional add-on question to that that because newer technologies give us abilities to create newer services and products which a customer may not know so isn't that a good strategy of putting technology first to create some of these right so i think this is the famous steve jobs uh, code that customer doesn't always know uh, what's around the corner so yes, uh, I agree with you. I think that's why you need to ask two questions. One is what problem are we trying to solve? This may be existing problem or what new opportunity we are trying to capture. And when you talk about new opportunity, so again, uh, there also, I would not start with technology. Technology in the background and says, what new opportunity can we capture and what technology might help to capture that? So uh, that's a fair question. And I think that's absolutely right. You should not always start with a customer. But I would say you should not start with technology, you should start with an opportunity, a business opportunity. And technology may be a solution there or something else may be a solution there. Good. Uh, a, a very different question, uh, Dr. Gupta. How do you find time from all your crazy schedule to write a book? Well, that's what we get paid for, right? Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, the, the way the book happened was not because I wanted to write a book. Uh, I was running this large executive program here uh, at HBS. And given my interest in this, we have written lots of cases. I talked to lots of companies. Uh, and we get a lot of people from the businesses that I talked about who are going through this transition. So I would share my ideas with them in the part of the course. And many of them said, where can I read more about this? And I said, it's all in my head. Uh, because it's in different places. I sort of synthesize my own thinking. And I think it came from, from those executives, this sort of desire to say, hey, can you put this together in, in a form of an article, in a book or something? So it, that prompted me. And of course, it, as you know, book writing is, is a, not a trivial process uh, and everybody writes it in a different fashion. But we have a lot of research associates and support uh, to do that. So it, it's a labor of love. It's kind of a fun to do that. Uh, and it also part of the curiosity that we all have as faculty to learn and, and share. No, I'm, I'm really glad you found the time because uh, at least at our institute, we use the book in several courses, including operations management, digital transformation, customer management, oh, wow. because you can really peel the, peel the onion in multiple ways. So uh, that's <laughs> really glad you found the time. Uh, possibly one last question before we let you go, uh, Dr. Gupta, I know it's kind of uh, early in the morning. Uh, uh, so the question is that, uh, uh, can you share some foresights in terms of what are the new disruption trends that you uh, envisage going into the next five years? So I think we have seen a lot of shifts in the B2C business. I think there will be a lot of changes that will happen in the B2B business. Uh, so for example, uh, you talked about blockchain. I've uh, talked to lots of companies where they're using blockchain for cross-border transactions. And uh, so think about the shipping business and all the uh, supply chain that goes from China and product coming to different places. There are so many hands that come in between, intermediaries that are in between, and there's so many paper trail that goes on. All that will be digitized and all that will go through blockchain. Now, large company like JP Morgan is working on that. JP Morgan has launched a platform called Onyx. There are other smaller players working on that. And that's a trillion dollar industry. So that is not visible to many of us as consumers, uh, but that is gonna be a huge disruption in the good old traditional businesses that's going on. Uh, uh, now, of course, a lot of people are talking about metaverse because of uh, uh, Zuckerberg, uh, but I think that the, the gaming industry is also ripe for lots of major changes, uh, whether it's metaverse or other forms. Uh, that, so I think the uh, and it could be fashion industry selling products in the virtual world or what have you. So I think that all the AR, VR, so I, I think the technology is already there. The AR, VR, blockchain, NFTs, all, all this is already there. It's just the applications of them will become much more 
uh, and I think the, the digital currency, you will see huge shifts in that as well. And that will change the whole banking system and the shopping experience and everything else. Now, whether it's central bank digital currency or something else, I don't know because China can force people to accept that. Countries like India and US, there will be huge issues of privacy and, and uh, release of data. So it'll be somewhere in between, but there is a, and that is good for the governments also because of financial inclusion and many other things uh, that happen. So, I mean, it's hard to know what new technology may come up in the future, but I think we have enough new technologies which have not been completely leveraged. Uh, and I see that happening in the next five years. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Gupta, if you have one more minute, one last question. Uh, how can academic institutions and industry collaborate in the digital space? I guess you have uh, extensive experience in this. So I guess some of the audience who are from the academia are interested to know how they can collaborate with industry on, uh, on in the digital space in general, in terms of research and other areas. So I think, that, I mean, industries are always, I find industries are always eager to learn because this is a completely uh, new area for them as well. And the advantage that we have as academics that is that we look across companies and across industries. Even if you are a CEO of a large company, you only know one area. And I always find that the best learning comes from looking outside your industry. So I'll give you one example. Cimex in Mexico is one of the largest cement companies. And one of their biggest problems was that they, when they send this pre-mixed cements to the construction sites, that they were fighting the traffic of the Mexico city and the construction things are not, never on time. So by the time the truck reaches, the cement is already set. So the problem was, how do you forecast the demand to make sure that you send the truck at the right time and in spite of the uncertainty of the traffic on the road? And they, where they learned from is not from another cement company. They actually went to a hospital in Houston to work with them. And you say, why are the cement company working with a hospital in Houston? Because they said a hospital doesn't know when an ambulance may be needed and what the traffic on the road might be, but they still save a patient. So they must be doing something and we can learn from that. I think we as academics can look across industries and connect the dots and abstract those principles. Our job is to abstract those general principles that apply across companies, right? That's what we teach. Uh, and I think the industry really benefits from them because they are very good in their own industry, but they are very bad looking across the industries. Got it. So uh, I, I guess with the end of that, we, we come to the end of uh, today's panel, uh, today's uh, keynote. Uh, Dr. Gupta, on behalf of uh, Dr. Janat Shah, uh, the faculty and students and alumni of IIM Udaipur, uh, and uh, uh, the several hundred of uh, industry uh, personnel who are there on this call, uh, we'd like to th thank you for your time today. This was a great talk, uh, always very inspiring to, to listen to you. So thank you again and uh, have a good day and have a good weekend. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me and have a wonderful 10th anniversary. Yeah, I'd like to hand over to Professor Janat Shah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sunil, for that wonderful, you know, uh, it's so enlightening especially from the all of us. I was looking at from an education perspective, that what does education look like? And you know, your thoughts on all the dimensions, I think for all of us are going to be very valuable. So thank you once again for being with us uh, today. And really, I think it, we couldn't have asked for anything better to kick start our, you know, celebrating IDK. Thank you once again. Appreciate it. Good luck. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for your questions. Uh, I think it was a very engaging session. Uh, we just give a few minutes for our panelists to join in, and uh, we will start the uh, panel discussion in just two minutes. So please hang in there.
good evening and welcome back uh, i'd like to welcome our panelists uh, simon uh, vidisha and uh, is oh kavita you are here as well great thanks thank you for joining uh, sorry for uh, the few minutes of delay we were just having some technical issues like everything online uh, uh, really appreciate your time today so we have a fairly a uh, large audience today and uh, we look forward to an engaging discussion so before uh, uh, i start off i like to introduce our panelists uh, to our audience so we have uh, kavita chaturvedi who is the india ceo uh, of itc snack food business uh, kavita is a graduate of mica uh, and she has nearly two decades of experience in consumer products which includes the creation development and nurturing of uh, some of india's foremost food brands uh, she's been named among india's most influential marketing leaders in uh, 2021 so congratulations kavita uh, by the business world and uh, kavita is also instrumental in launching several brands uh, such as sanfi steepy noodles uh, tricolor pasta and uh, febel chocolate so all my favorites Uh, I, i wish this was an in person meeting then maybe kavita could have got us some samples uh i like to introduce uh, our second panelist uh, bidisha nagraj uh, who is the vp global marketing uh, for schneider electric india and also the board director of uh, schneider infrastructure uh, bidisha has over 25 years of cross industry experience in marketing uh, she is a thought leader and a strategic market expert and spent significant amount time of her career in technology retail and entrepreneurship uh, she has worked in diverse industries uh, uh, bilisha i thought i came with the most diverse experience but you beat me hands down so <laughs> we must have a chat about this uh, and uh, worked in uh, companies including intel google and uh, coffee day this uh, has been a, a keen proponent of an area that is of great interest to both uh, industry and academia today which is uh, the intersection of uh, digital and sustainability so hopefully we'll have a conversation around that uh, and uh, we also have simon uh, thomas uh, the head of data and ai for avanard uh, simon thank you very much i know it's really late in the night in singapore so uh, i hope you got yourself a strong cup of coffee uh, Simon leads uh, Avanard's global data and applied intelligence business uh, which harnesses the combined power of AI analytics and intelligent automation to help clients up, uh, clients apply driven intelligence into what they do so uh, uh, we appreciate you joining us uh, an interesting fact about Simon is uh, that he spent his early years in music uh, he's a graduate from the Berkeley School of Music and was a sound engineer So we have the perfect recipe for a great evening. We have coffee, we have chocolate, <laughs> and we have music. So can't be a better evening. So welcome and thank you once again uh, for joining us today. Uh, we have a audience of a mixed audience. So we have some students. We have several uh, industry personnel from all sectors: uh, public sector, private sector, large companies, startups, small and medium businesses. Uh, <clears throat> and we also have faculty so it's a very interesting combination and hopefully uh, that will give us some very engaging questions uh, but i like to really start, each one of you kind of represents very different industries and that's what really excited us uh, vidisha and kavita i guess you represent what in my past life i would refer to as the client side i'm sure simon mm -hmm. will uh, smile when i say that and uh, simon you represent my past life which is digital consulting and the solu digital solutions world so it's a great mix um uh, i like really like to start off by asking each one of you and can uh, go in any sequence that you want in terms of what does digital transformation really mean from your perspective and from your industry's perspective because it, it's a it's a obviously a most used word but also the most misused word so just wanted to get a sense from each one of you on what digital transformation really means from your perspective and your industry perspective and uh, yeah, I, I, any of you could start and we'll just go through each one yeah i'd like to get all your opinions on this so, kavita would you like to kick us off um 
So when I think about it, you know, it's a continuous process. So I started my career in 2001, which was the year of the dot-com boom and then followed by the bust. And, you know, so I think for as long as I have worked, um, there's been, uh, you know, the digital buzz has always been there. And so as far as digital transformation is concerned, it's not a thing you do one time. It's a continuous process. It's about continuous learning and, you know, continually staying abreast of what's happening uh, and, uh, you know, moving with the times, leading the curve. Um, you know, and um, when I speak about, let's say, my industry, and I've spent uh, pretty much my entire career in FMCG and bulk of it in food. You, uh, the, the obvious thing to think of, you know, because with FMCG and food products, our products are consumed by just so many people on literally a daily basis. You think about the consumer side of things. So you think about, uh, you know, um, all the transformation in current times, for example, about the fact that, um, you, you know, the, uh, the fact that uh, there's just so much of research just by listening online, you know, uh, that uh, so we have, let's say, Sixth Sense, for example, which does a lot of listening, consumer listening. So a lot of research that can happen so much faster about how you know uh, timelines have really shortened uh, feedback loops have shortened so there is the entire consumer piece or even now that your consumers are spending all their time online um, your product is not just the product you sell but even the communication that you put out online so the so we treat uh, every piece of content that you create like our product so um, you know how uh, so there is the entire front end piece and one typically thinks of fmcg only in terms of front end but FMCG is also an agglomeration of so many industries. So there's transformation that's happened as far as sourcing is concerned. Um, you know, all your whole vendor database, reverse auctions, all of that. Or there's transformation in manufacturing. And I'm certain that, you know, Bidisha will talk about it in greater detail. But there's the entire buzz these days about, you know, industry 4.0 and um, how you can use data to uh, increase uptimes, improve yields and so on. Then there's transformation in value chain. So there's constant transformation across uh, this agglomeration of industries. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, whatever I've learned is that it's a continual process and you have to have a great partner ecosystem and you have to constantly have this appetite to learn and a culture, you have to embed it in your culture. So that's the way I see it. I know I took a long time to answer, no, but that's, that's the way I see it. You've raised a lot of points as I jotted down and we'll come back to those first questions. So uh, uh, Vidisha, would you like to address this next? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that. And I'm so sorry, I couldn't, uh, I know it's a digital platform and I couldn't get my background right. So, uh, <laughs> you know, sorry about that. We, we like um, your background, Vidisha. Really, really, you you must know, tell us uh, who the artist is. Yeah, I will. Um, you know, actually, the word digitization is uh, at Schneider, uh, you know, we, we look at it in two dimensions. One dimension, which is the the fact that it's it's in our core of our business, right? It's in the DNA of our business. It's what we do. Uh, and I'll take a minute to talk about uh, what, what that is. You know, Schneider Electric is in the space of energy management, which means that we work with various sectors, whether it's um, uh, coffee shops, whether it's buildings, whether it's hospitals, whether it's industries, uh, FMCG industries, CPG, etc we help them manage their energy better. Now, uh, and as a consequence, what happens is that we are trying to address the biggest problem that the world is going through, which is climate change. Uh, we are trying to make the planet more livable. We're trying to make sure that we hand over a better planet to our next generation, because there are just two things, uh, two big components and drivers for that uh, climate change that we're all trying to work towards. Uh, number one is electricity, because electricity is the only vector that can be decarbonized, as we know. And the second thing is digitization. Because if we, if, if buildings, if infrastructures, if uh, uh, data centers, if, if uh, you know, hospitals, etc., don't manage their energy, uh, which means that there is a lot of carbon footprint that's going on, and you can manage energy only through digitization because uh, what you don't measure, you can never track, right? So digitization is the core of our business. Uh, we digitize our own operations and we help uh, our customers and our partners and our ecosystems digitize so as to manage their energy better, so as to have uh, a lesser carbon footprint, so as to 
address the big COP26 topic that's going on, which is the 1.5 degrees threshold of, of climate change. The other part of digitization is, of course, um, you know, we walk the talk ourselves, right? Um, which is in our operations, in our supply chain, in our uh, go-to-market, in our um, uh, customer engagement, you know, what we call the end-to-end -end customer engagement, in our communication and marketing, uh, digital, um, you know, we spend close to about 85% of marketing budgets on digital, right? So uh, when, when COVID hit us, uh, uh, honestly, you know, we were ready. We were, we were future ready because, you know, that's the core of our business. There is a significant investment that we do uh, to get our sales organization uh, digital, digital ready because, you know, it's a mindset shift, right? So, um, uh, and we'll pass it on to Simon for his views, but digital is the core of our business. Digital is what we uh, exercise with our customers and it's, we, we sort of uh, drink our own Kool-Aid, you know, by, by walking the talk ourselves. So I'll stop here, uh, Srini, and we can, of course, uh, go into questions later. Definitely, we'll come back to a lot of those points. So, so Simon, uh, over to you, please. Yeah, thanks, Shini. Uh, th and uh, you know, really appreciate uh, being part of this panel. I really feel like uh, the uh, very dull thorn between among uh, among roses here. Um, <laughs> but um, um, I guess you know, and and I think Shini, you know this uh, in, in our in our industry or in, in your previous industry, my industry now, uh, you know, consulting, system integration, management consulting, whatever you want to call it. Um, I mean, there are two words when put together represent the key, you know, to the door of almost any CXO out there, right? Digital and transformation, right? Uh, I mean, there was a time actually maybe five or six years ago where, you know, there was an obvious kind of one upmanship going on out there amongst the CXOs in, uh, in any given market, right? Um, I mean, I've, I've literally signed digital transformation deals where you know, I knew as we were signing the deal that the primary purpose of the deal that we signed was for the CEO to have bragging rights at the uh, weekend golf tournament, right? Uh, and you know, in those cases, it actually you, you you actually found out that that was the reason, and, and that's usually the you know the failure of the of the um, of the whole endeavor, right? But actually, seriously now, I mean, we live in a digital world, right? And and all of you out there, um, you know, maybe other than the profs and myself. And of course, Bidisha, by you know, what she just uh, showed with the background, uh, are digital natives, right? And you know, if this crazy pandemic has shown us anything, right? It's shown the world that we can all exist in a digital, you know, uh, in a digital world, right? And not only that, we can exist quite effectively, right? Uh, now, let me let me be clear. I said effectively, not not happily, right? Um, but, uh, but, you know, it, it's really shown us that we can, we can, you know, take advantage of digital capabilities like we've never done before, right? Uh, Benicia described the digital mandate super well. I, I loved it. Um, and for any business starting out out there today, there's no option but digital. There's nothing else. That's it. I mean, digital is the only option out there, right? Uh, but, and, and generally, you know, if you are, in a business that finds yourself sitting in a boardroom with consultants trying to convince you on digital transformation, um, you know, seriously, it's too late, um, you know, and uh, you, you're in trouble already, right? So, you know, if, if, if you're in that situation, you know, recognize the, uh, the dire straits that you're in, right? So, so for me, digital is an imperative, right? And if you're not already there, then transformation is the most urgent item uh, on your agenda. Thanks. Thanks. So no, no. I think uh, that that makes us. I think maybe pre-COVID, that was digital was still an option and bragging rights. But I think COVID has kind of accelerated that, and it's no longer uh, an option. But uh, each. So I think all three of you kind of concurred on that. That digital now is an imperative. Right? But but how do companies? How can companies prioritize what they should be doing? Because uh, as uh, several of you said that, you know, there are so many aspects of your traditional organizations that can be transformed. So uh, where does the company start? I mean, should they be focusing on their operational aspects, the supply chain side of it? Should they be focusing on the front end customer aspects? Now, obviously the answer is that all they should focus on everything, but you know, there is constraints in terms of resources and technology and so on. So 
just wanted to get your thoughts uh, in terms of you know how does a company start looking at where to start this whole journey or where to kind of accelerate this journey if they've already started um, ladies i could go go ahead um you know so so um i think you know probably the you know customer is the obvious right answer right i mean it, it has to be right um, if the focus of your digital transformation is not your customer, then it's a bit like that CEO I mentioned earlier, right? Um, but you know, what, what, what's most difficult? What's what you know? But the um, the the other side of it is actually the people, right? The people in the organization, right? Because I think so often I find that, especially in my role as a consultant going in. Uh, I mean, the client's only interested in the, you know, the cool technology that they're going to, you know, have in-house, you know, at the end of the project, right? And they completely miss the fact that it's actually about their people, right? Um, and so on both sides, I think with the customer and with the people, you know, my advice, you know, the clients is always, look, you know, start with the biggest problem you're having with being effective with your customer, Right whatever that is, right? Don't, don't start from a blueprint and don't start with some major kind of architecture of the organization, blah, blah. Just start with a problem. You know, are you, are you having problems, you know, fulfilling your, your, you know, your, your product, your business to, you know, to your end customer? Well, start with that, right? And then on the other side, then focus on the people in your organization who are administering and, and acting in that uh, you know, particular area of your business, right? Uh, and then finally, you decide what's the technology that's needed to solve the problem and help you know, your people uh, be more effective, right? But for me, that's really, you know, um, th that's really the focus of digital transformation. It's, it's, it's not that sort of you know, natural connection from digital to technology. Right, it's about the customer and it's about the people in the uh, in, in in the organization. No, I, I I don't disagree, Simon. But I guess I'll, I'll throw a question to Vidisha and Kavita on that. That if you don't get your back end right, then aren't you over promising to your customer if you start with the customer? So should we you be fixing the back end first before you start the front end part of it, the customer facing side of digital transformation? Right. I can I can go next. You know. Um, when and Simon has brought up a very important point, which is, uh, you know, it's about people first, right? How do you get your sales organization digital ready? I mean, how there's no point getting your customers, uh, you know, use getting digital tools where your sales guy is still saying, "Sir, can I come and meet you and take the deal over a cup of coffee?" Right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I I worked in companies like Google before where. Uh, uh, you know, most of the uh, employee base are digital natives, right? A younger workforce, uh, uh, digital native people, whereas uh, companies like Schneider Electric, um, which has been around for 50, 60 years, uh, it's a very strong B2B, uh, you know, a mindset kind of a company, um, you know, everybody's an engineer around, etc. Uh, which is not digital natives, right? So I think I think a one size does not fit all in the digital transformation process. Uh, in the company that I am in today, uh, you know, our journey started uh, very interestingly. Our journey started by uh, uh, people, you know, sort of uh, getting to know at a very superficial level what does digital transformation mean? Because at the cocktail party that I'm going to attend in the evening, I can I can speak the right words, right? Then it moved to, uh, no, it's an imperative, you know. Uh, uh, then it moved to a whole bunch of knowledge series, uh, training where, uh, you know, uh, em employees at different levels were trained about some of the basics of digital, uh, you know, et cetera. Then it moved to uh, adopting digital tech, uh, tools and adopting databases. Right, using Salesforce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is how do you digitize your entire data, right? So, and then of course it moved to, um, you know, uh, okay, I have this data, I have tools, uh, how do I, how do I communicate? And then the experiential bit came in, right? How do you create the best experience in the customer delight, um, et cetera, et cetera? So I think uh, 
uh, it's a it's a journey. Uh, I don't think, um, and in, in the case of Schneider, there's another additional layer, which is our go-to market uh, is not, is, is going to end customers directly, but it's also going through our partners, which means that uh, I need to get my partners ready, digitally ready, because if I'm running at a particular speed and they are lagging behind, uh, you know, then somewhere something is going to fall through. So there, there are different layers of digital transformation. I don't think um, I don't think we can choose between one or the other, but yes, um, you know the entire organization needs to be digitally ready. Also, a very important thing before I pass it on to Kavita is it's a mindset shift, uh, which is what I, I, I you know experiences uh, experience between companies of Google and Intel and a Coffee Day and a Schneider. It is a mindset shift uh, that people need to adopt. Thanks. Uh, Kavita, just an additional question for you as you address this. Uh, do you generally see that digital transformation starts at the top or is it bottom up or uh, what's what's been your experience with it? Oh. So you have to have everybody believing in it. And the people in the leadership roles have a very, very, very important role to play in terms of, uh, because like Simon was saying, it's about people. And I'll add to that, you know, uh, the fact that there's there's people and then there's culture. So culture gets driven from the top. And therefore it's extremely important for the top leadership to be completely driving this. So uh, organizations like ours actually have things like a digital council. And then we have um, a young digital leader. So, you know, because um, as far as digital is concerned, it's a lot about reverse mentorship also. So it's about, um, you know, having younger people. So typically you will have your boards or your management committees comprising people above the age of 40. Uh, but as far as digital leaders are concerned, we have a young digital uh, leaders forum also, uh, which comprises people in their 20s. So there, there is the role of the top because the culture gets driven from the top. But there is the role of young people to keep bringing in fresh ideas, driving those. And, and these young people have to be extremely empowered and uh, so that they can drive ideas you know and 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 uh, possibly entirely drive for the delivery of new projects now coming back to your question about you know where do you start and uh, whether it's the customer or whether it's uh, technology or processes and so on and also about your question about you know how do you drive other priorities um, so i i i I uh, have never seen uh, this being at odds. I, I see digital being as something that has to be embedded in the way you work. It has to be embedded in your culture. So I've never seen it as, as being at odds with other priorities. It's, it's a part of life. I think uh, the other panelists spoke about the fact that it's an imperative. It's a part of life. It better be a part of your life. Um, and, um, you know, um, I, I, and it is true that, you know, that there are just so many things and maybe I can bring in an FMCG perspective since our products are used by people every day. If you are not listening, your consumers are online, living their lives online, and it's not just uh, or the, their lives on WhatsApp and so on. And um, if I just talk about things, if you're not really able to track conversations about your brand, or know uh, what, what's happening. Um, you can't fight. Uh, this is the day and age of fake news. I think in the last two years, we must have fought 25 bits of you know big fake news, right? From let's say uh, we sell a brand of flour, Ashirvad Atta, which is India's number one. I, I think it's globally also one of the largest flour brands. And there was this entire uh, fake news spreading about how uh, you know Atta is made of plastic or you know stuff like that. So, so I'm just giving that as an example. If you're not listening, then there's a whole conversation that's happening about your brands, which may not necessarily be true. And you're not, uh, you know, you, you could just be left behind. You might not know why, why your sale is dropping the way it is. So it's really important. So it's not about, you know, you do not have a choice anymore. You've got to, you've got to listen. Um, one is to just manage your reputation. But over and above that, if you're really listening, there's a lot of inciting that is to be had by listening. Um, but but as far as I'm concerned, it's about, you know, it, it's if you have started your journey early, then you're no longer jostling between priorities. So you're already, you know, because at, at every end, whether it's, you know, whether it is for us, um, our customers are also the millions of Kirana stores that you sell to. 
uh, of course, during the pandemic, uh, there was this whole acceleration towards e-commerce. But even after that, 90% of business lies outside of e-commerce for FMCG. Um, and so for the Kirana store owners, they suddenly started. So we have a lot of, uh, and not just us, most FMCG players have, you know, the B2B uh, websites where they can order our products from. So they needed supplies to, you know, cater to a billion plus Indians. Uh, um, and uh, so we found that there is, uh, you know, that level of customer also who have happily adapted to uh, a lot of offers that we had in place uh, before the pandemic, but may have uh, found lesser adoption. But through the pandemic, uh, where you couldn't necessarily service as many outlets directly, we found a lot of adoption for uh, things like, uh, you know, our B2B apps and so on. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't see digital jostling with other priorities. I see it as uh, an imperative, a way of life. And uh, uh, the point that we made that it needs to be driven uh, by everybody uh, and culture is driven from the top, but it's something that uh, everybody has to live and breathe and it has to be a priority. It has to be a way of working. No, th thanks for that. And I, I really want to uh, have a few questions around that. And uh, and maybe we can get Simon's view from the consulting side and then uh, your views as well is that uh, digital is not one time, right? It's not that you're you're done and that's it. And you say, okay, with well, the next thing that happens five years later, we'll restart. It is going to be continuous. Uh, uh, it's the speed of transformation and disruption is, has really picked up. So how can organizations really create a culture which which can be agile especially large organizations which uh, all of you represent uh, how can they build in that agility within their organizations to be able to absorb what's going on uh, uh, sense making of what's going on and and actually implement this change so i i like to get uh, both from uh, simon's view as a pro, as a consultant and also uh, vidisha and kavita's view in terms of you know, kavita you did already give a few examples of you know innovation councils and all but just wanted to get your thoughts on that yeah no i think you know i think it was bidisha that mentioned earlier you know culture right i think it's so important right because um i mean digital transformation can cannot be a project right it, it just cannot be you know some initiative right that that uh, you know you're going to run for six months or nine months or whatever it is right uh, it might start off with with uh, engagement with uh, you know a, a firm a consultancy or somebody to come in and just kind of get get things put in place right but it has to be um, embedded I mean the, if the, the culture has of the of the organization has to change to embrace digital right um, and if that happens and and the priority you know the true north is always digital right anytime you come to a choice where you can go with a digital op option or go the old-fashioned way, if the company had a culture that always chose to go down the digital path, right, uh, you're on the right course, right? And so, so I think I think it's 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 really it starts with that, right? And then it's also kind of the the wherewithal, right, and the uh, if you want to call it grit to just kind of push through, right? Because you know it's not simple, it's not easy to transform. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know one of the biggest hurdles you find is is your people, right? Because you you bring in this amazing technology. And then you find that you know your people are actually struggling with it. So whatever gains you expected to get from the technology, you're now losing because your people are less productive and, and are having difficulty, you know, um, uh, dealing with it. So, so I think you know it's it's a it's a culture, um, you know, and then it's sort of this longer term focus, right, and uh, and discipline, you know, to kind of be always looking out to make sure you're, you're, you're making the right moves towards that end goal of becoming a digital organization, right? Good. Thanks. I, I, so, so I just want to add on to that, and maybe Kavita and Pidisha, you can uh, react to this, is that, you know, especially large companies, and I've worked in several as well, we're very process driven, right? We have a process and a, and a manual for everything. Uh, but on the now we want to be agile, and we want to rapidly change how how do companies how can companies manage these contradictions because you do need processes you're a large company it can't be laissez faire all the time but at the same time you need to be able to be you need to be agile and so how do you manage this conflict uh, are these conflicting messages to your employees that your tnd has to go through seven steps but be agile when it comes to innovation you know i uh, <clears throat> and again uh, maybe Maybe I'm giving very old-fashioned answers, you know. But sometimes old-fashioned 
uh, is still still uh, fashionable, right? Um, you know, for organizations which are large, which are process driven, uh, which are uh, multicultural, multi age group driven, etc. Um, honestly, in my experience, we've seen uh, it is driven through KPIs. You know, whether we like it or not. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we tried. We tried uh, the non KPI route. Uh, but then, you know, it, it, it then it becomes an initiative, right? Then it's uh, so. I think to to make it part of your, uh, you know, your part of your uh, uh, way of doing business, part of your performance appraisal, uh, I think drives it at the end of the day. Uh, uh, that is one. So that's the way you, uh, like I said in Schneider, there are two ways. One is digital is our product. And two is digital is, is the way we uh, operate. When it's our product, you know, we have uh, uh, what we call an ecostructure stack, which is a IIoT, uh, you know, stack, which helps people manage their energy. There is a, that's clearly KPI driven, that X percentage of your business has to be ecostructure, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The other part is uh, how do you, how do you uh, do business using digital uh, tools? You, you see, um, when we started off, uh, digital was essentially an experiential uh, a tool, experiential, uh, you know, a, a marketing department driving digital. Today, we've moved it, uh, not completely, but I think the endeavor in the next four years is to move it completely to become a commercial tool, uh, which is we do business using digital uh, tools, e-commerce being one, you know, uh, marketplaces being the other, uh, different models of e-business, right? Um, you'll be, you'll be uh, uh, when I say this to people, uh, you know, they, they're actually quite surprised because Schneider Electric, being a B2B business, you know, we have this beautiful target audience definition uh, of being an electrician to a CEO, right? Everybody in between is our target audience. Today, um, um, uh, we have mobile apps for our electricians. We do business uh, with mobile apps, right? So we started that many years back. So I think um, coming back to your question, in process-driven companies, uh, it has, culture is a very important part, as Kavita and Simon said. Uh, two is, it needs to be part of your performance appraisal. Uh, otherwise, it's difficult to drive it. I mean, very simple, very old-fashioned way, but I think that way still works. Got it, thanks. So uh, Kavita, a slight variation of the, of the same question to you possibly is that, uh, obviously, in the FMC, FMCG business, a lot of the competition is coming from these newer startups, right? So, uh, and they're, ab they're able to scale much faster than, say, so traditional companies. When we launched a product or when I launched a product, say, 30 years ago, it took a long time to get market share. But today, these startups are growing much faster. So how, uh, as a large company, how can large companies kind of you know, be agile to deal with a lot of competition that's coming from these newer disruptors, startups, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to answer both questions. I'm going to answer the one on process because I actually think that digital uh, does not in any way. So it's not like pro uh, it's not like processes delay digital. In fact, digital has enabled you to do things much faster. So I, I remember when I started my career, a pack test would take you three weeks. You know, uh, so you would have something called CAPI, which was, uh, and PAPI, which was paper-based testing and CAPI was computer-based testing. And you would still take three weeks if you were doing an all India pack test. And I remember when we were launching for Bell, which is luxury chocolates, we did our entire pack test, I think in maybe a day or two, because you had your, you know, so you, you can still do the process and you can do it a lot faster. If you have e-stores, so uh, I remember in the early days, you would do pilots in markets, right? A, a product launch would be piloted. We call it STM. And uh, you you take your couple of months to get results, but you were actually having to do the physical grind of launching across a large number of stores. Now you can put your products out just on e-commerce. And if they survive, depending on how they're doing, and you're getting so much data on a daily basis. There was a time when you would have to, you know, actually get trackers. Your sales team would be filling Excels while also selling so that you would get trackers. Now you have everything available to you digitally without people spending time on these non-value added activities. They can just focus on the selling. So I actually think that for a process-driven company, digital is a huge blessing uh, because there's just um, a speed that's been shortened. You can still do all of your processes. So, and I give you some examples. Now, coming back to your question about startups. So 
actually to be really honest getting scale so when you talk about scale in fmcg getting scale so the numbers for a startup will never be the sort that excite me you know in the in the sense that um, and i'm talking fmcg startup here but there are a lot of good ideas there so so they may not have the scale but we can add value to those startups so you know i, I think it's important and you find this happening in fmcg you find a lot of players doing this so uh, you know be, because for us there's there's just a lot of business to be driven so not every great idea will be born out of like a big fmcg company or any large companies uh and the smaller companies may have great ideas but they would be bootstrapped and they can't scale up in the way that we can so i think it's a great opportunity there's a lot of win win that can be had if you could you know partner them invest in them help them uh achieve scale so i don't i i see it as a great uh, i think it's a great boon and i think there's a lot of win win that that can be had we can help them get scale um they can get access to better r and d through us because you know we would uh, large companies have great r and d um, um we understand regulatory much better and things like food and uh, uh, highly regulated so there's a, there's a, there's a lot of scope for partnership it's just that they don't get the scale but they have great ideas and uh, the trick is to recognize those and partner people and help them achieve scale Uh, you, uh, I was smiling when you spoke about the first part because when I started my career in market research, or uh, if I had to do a survey in Gauhati, I actually had to take a print those things, take a train, it yeah, would take yeah. three days to reach Gauhati. Now it's all online. No, it's a it's a great yeah, thought yeah. that actually it can still be process driven and digital enables that process to be done much faster and. Lot you of- know, I'll give you a very interesting example. Uh, so when we had the lockdowns, uh, one really missed your market visits. So in FMCG, you go and work the market, and you miss the market visits. And uh, it was amazing because all the retailers we could start doing our market visits through Zoom. So we would be at the can, the kaiye, show me your stock. Can I see what you're stocking right now? So you can even do your market visits online. So I think digital has really enabled so the much. Process. You don't have to. Yeah, yeah. I think we did some six hundred and forty market visits at that point in time, all online through Zoom. Do you ever want to go back into the market? Yes. Oh, I've been going back for the last five months. <laughs> I, I love the real, real thing too. Yeah. Uh, uh, Simon, uh, you know, our previous speaker, Pro- Professor uh, Sunil Gupta, was uh, uh, one of the leading professors at Harvard in digital. So he he came up with this whole concept. He talks about this whole concept about speed. Did I lose some? Yeah, I think. Uh, if you have a lot of legacy, then you launch. You were speed. you were, you were frozen there for a bit. Oh, okay. sorry. Uh, maybe I was frozen for a bit. I I, I missed a, a bit. bit a part no, no. I think it's the same. I think, uh, uh, yeah. Professor Shrinivas, you may want to just repeat yourself. Sure, I'll repeat. Okay. So, uh, uh, Dr. Sunil Gupta, who was the keynote the earlier today, was talking about uh, uh, landing docks and speed boats. That is, a company has a lot of legacy, then the best is to kind of create these speed boats which are of innovation rather than trying to innovate uh, the mothership right? so you you obviously deal with clients of all kinds yeah. of types and sizes so is there is there a recommendation that you know a company should either you know try and change the mothership or launch these speed do- uh, speed boats uh, you know is there a is there a way you can take a decision around these kind of things or yeah actually and and, and you know i think i'll be remiss if i don't also answer the process uh... <laughs> <laughs> question cuz uh, you know both my esteemed panelists have uh, taken a stab at it you know and i'll tie it into this question you asked me right cuz i don't think it's a either or right because if you look at any if you look at the way we deal with digitizing processes i mean the processes are there you you know we as humans we cannot operate in a world without process right um and so you know when you start digitizing processes in an, in an organization um what what's interesting is you know the first few that you do are going to be tough right but what you find is as you start doing more and more of these right what you did in the first what what you did to digitize the the first few you find that you as you do the next you know power 5 6 and then the next 20 and 30 you you're doing less and less because a lot of the stuff that you built in your you know on those initial processes are reusable right and and that is by the way a best practice right so in that same tone you know you can almost rebuild the mothership right by building you know smaller uh, you know i think you know uh, 
speed, speed ports, ports right? Uh, and what you do is, as you know, as the speed ports are built out to handle you know specific areas, you bring that back to the mothership and replace the portion of the mothership that you know did that in the old-fashioned way, right? So, so I think it's a it's a combination that going back even to your, your earlier question around how do companies deal with sort of you know getting on the digital journey and at the same time dealing with their you know legacy um i mean it's it's no longer a you know a, a, a choice you have to make right because i think there's a there's you know the technology and the way we you know the capabilities we have today um really allow us to have the best of both worlds i mean you know uh it, it's as, as as tough as that could be um you know you really could uh, you know get the best of um you know, both worlds here so if I if I understood it right, then it is kind of better to fix the mothership as well. And I think that's more or less what uh, Dr. Sunil Gupta said that if you launch the speedboat and it goes too far away from the mothership, then you're left with a mothership that hasn't changed. So he said yeah. you need to have those links back into the mothership. Uh, I mean, he was using a shipping analogy, but yeah, I yeah, guess that's yeah. essentially what you're saying. So a, a related question to that, and Vidisha, a company like Schneider, and again, you know, please don't share anything that's confidential, has grown through acquisitions over the last many years, right? You've made several acquisitions. Does Do, do M&A activities help you in your transformation? I mean, are, are they, I and mean, if you could also kind of give us a sense of what, what do some of these companies bring to the table? Uh, Vidisha, sorry, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, again, I don't want to generalize uh, things. Um, I mean, you know, with companies which are growing uh, with acquisitions, uh, there are a huge number of positives. But uh, one thing which is uh, constantly that we need to do is work on our culture, right? Because, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is your core culture? Because you're growing by acquisition. So then there's a new culture coming in, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, from a digitization standpoint, I would say, depending on what the m a is with, what kind of company it is with, uh, if it is with, um, you know, if it is with an agile driven, uh, you know, software startup kind of company, uh, for example, uh, quite recently, um, you know, there's a company called Aveva, uh, you know, who we uh, um, sort of acquired a few years back and they are, in the cutting edge of digitization, right? So uh, they brought in a lot of best practices and you know software tools and and uh, you know demonstrated uh, uh, from a, a sales organization, from a business organization, how to use the tools, how to be uh, uh, extremely efficient and productive by using digitization. So, but then then you also have companies which are even more. Um, I don't want to name companies, but older in their thinking, uh, they haven't even started the digitization journey, uh, then it's a very different thing, right? So it really depends on uh, what is the kind of acquisition that's happening. And, you know, uh, do we need to go back to a 1.0, uh, which we started ourselves 10 years back, or can we learn from the other acquiring company? So it really depends. Okay. Uh, anybody else would like to add to that in terms of whether... Uh... Uh, m a is a good way to uh, to get agility and to acquire new skills so, uh, I'd, I'd go back to the speedboat i mean and and you could make an acquisition that could be a speedboat right you know uh that ends up sort of replace uh, you know uh, or re replacing or or uh, adding to something that you had in your in your big ship right uh i, I love that analogy i'm gonna i'm gonna use it all the time now the big ship and the uh, speed boats right i got this picture of a whole bunch of speed boats going in one direction replacing the ship right so anyway yeah so he actually talks about landing docks and speed boats and uh, uh I, I i've been teaching this concept for a long time but it's only today he told me saying do have a rope between the speed boat and the mothership always it'll go too far and you won't be able to do much so i have to go back and correct all the years of teaching that wrongly <laughs> yeah. so i actually want to move on to a, a slightly different topic and uh, it's quite surprising we always i mean I, I attend a lot of these discussions and i also moderate a few of them and most people think that you know a conversation on digital transformation is about technology but frankly for 45 minutes we've been talking about people and we're talking about culture and 
uh, a lot of people say, but what happened to the technology in all of this, right? I and mean, why are you talking about people? So let's do spend a little bit of time on, on the technology side of it. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, uh, almost going back to that CEO, Simon, whom you would, who wants to, who wants bragging rights, right? I mean, uh, are there situations where you rather leave, you want to position yourself as at the cutting edge of, edge of technology and even though there is no immediate need for something uh, like say blockchain, right? Everybody's talking about that. And now that metaverse has been announced, everybody's talking about AR, VR. So uh, as a company, should you be at least signaling that you are you're looking at that or should it be completely customer driven or, or a need driven? I can, I can go ahead and start. I think, you know, the wonderful thing about the world today is you don't have to get an SAP, right? You don't have to get an Oracle. You don't have to get a JD Edwards that kind of comes in and you, you just have to get it all or nothing, right? The wonderful thing today is you can pick and choose, right? I, I always make the analogy, if, you, if you've ever visited Singapore or Malaysia, right? <clears throat> it's sort of the um, this analogy of the restaurant where you sit down and you got one menu versus the food court right, where you can sit in one space and get everything and anything that you desire, right? <clears throat> and it's the same with technology today, with cloud and with, uh, with, with shared services and, and um, uh, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. Sorry, I got something in my throat. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a whole new world out there, right? And you can actually pick and choose the right technologies. It, it doesn't, the homogeneity, homo Homogeneity is no longer required, right? A, a heterogeneous technology framework, right, is much, much more powerful, uh, you know, today, right? So, so I think I think that the technology it's important, right? I think you want to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, you're not missing a big technology turn, right? Um, and you're not kind of, uh, you know, behind. But at the same time, you, you don't want to just get the technology because it's the coolest thing out there, right? Uh, it, it has to be practical and applicable to something you're trying to solve, right? I think that's the that's the piece we always you know uh, tell tell our clients is look, you know yes you know you you, you probably want a virtual agent in your con in a contact center, but you know first ask yourself you know how are your customers going to deal with a virtual agent? Are they ready for it, right? Um, or you know and that sort of thing. So, great, thanks. And. Uh... You know, I, I'm sure he was misquoted, but Steve Jobs is supposed to have said that if I ask my customer what they want, they wouldn't know it. But I think he really meant they wouldn't be able to articulate it. Uh, but I really wanted to extend that question to Kavita and Vidisha that uh, are there situations where you sit down in a meeting at a senior CXO meeting and saying, hey, this is a new technology that's coming in. You know, where can we apply it? Or do you wait or, or do you actually go customer saying that this is an issue that we need to solve and what's the best technology or, but are there ways sometimes where you do it the other way around as well? You know, uh, okay, go ahead, go ahead, Kavita. Okay, um, so it's true that, um, you know, if the customer always, you know, knew what they wanted or was always able to articulate, um, you know, what had to be done next, then, uh, th th then there's no role of inside, then everybody would be doing exactly the same thing. And uh, my experience is that uh, the best of ideas are never, have never really been, uh, no consumer would have ever said, you know, something that would have really, let's say, opened up the market for you or helped you gain market share. It would have never been necessarily articulated by a consumer. It would have been something that you would have observed and you would do a lot joining of the so so yeah that that is true but uh, you don't use technology for the sake of using technologies which is exactly what uh, i think simon was saying right now there has to be an end you have to be able to end the search the end so just because the consumer didn't articulate it, it doesn't mean you're not going to do it so um i remember we were using um, on a lot of our websites also in the early days we used to have uh, you know a virtual assistance chatbots a lot earlier because um there were certain parts of the country where people needed a lot of help with recipes with a product that we had so the chatbot would help guide you so you know what plan your meal 
plan recipes, etc. So when you're using it, we might have been among the first people to do it, but it was to solve a consumer problem, whether stated or not. So that's the way one sees it. You don't use technology for the heck of using technology because then that's not going to get you anywhere. And then that's the end of experimentation because you should be able to answer as to, you know, you should always have an answer as to why you did what you did. So uh, you'll always have to answer a problem and um, you, you uh, the beauty of it lies in being able to do the inciting, join the dots, because the biggest problems are never articulated. I just want to add one more thing. You know, uh, I think both Kavita and Simon were, are, are saying this, and I just want to, uh, you know, sort of sum it up by saying that define the objectives of digital transformation. Uh, in our case, we say it is about a digital, it's, it's about an end-to-end -end digital customer journey, right? And what is that customer journey? It is about customer delight. It is about making it easy to do business with us anywhere, anytime, you know, uh, uh, regardless of the, of the tool. So I think it is defining why you're doing this digital transformation, you know, define the objectives. And I think then there's enough out there today. Uh, I think technology is never, you know, we're spoiled with choice, right, to a large extent. But do you have a team that uh, tracks the latest technology developments? And uh... yeah, we have, at least in Schneider, we have an entire digital team. It's called the Schneider Digital Team, which is uh, which is constantly, uh, uh, you know, uh, advising us on the latest and the greatest technology tools that we can use. In which customer journey? You know, again, defining the customer journey is very important. Uh, a quotation tool. Uh, you know, maybe maybe very very uh, important for a sales organization, but uh, uh, to track uh, consumer insights, you know, through through uh, a conversation tools, etc., may be important to a marketing organization. So, it really depends on the customer journey and what tools are required. Where? I'm sorry. Did you want to add something? No, uh, it's actually just going to say that you know that the technology today. I mean, it, it's so cool in that. You know, even though there's so much variety today, right? Um, you know, I've I've had one of my one of my young consultants, you know, challenge me that, um, you know, the technology today is much more complex and varied than than you know when I when I was coming up in uh, in in technology of consulting. And I always tell them that you know, I, I actually it's completely the opposite, right? Yeah. Because the difference between SAP and Oracle, I mean, there was there was almost nothing the same between those two, right? But today, if you look at the difference between Microsoft and Google, right, you can make things work together so easily, right? You know, so so the, the technology kind of world we're in today, I mean, interoperability, sharing, you know, it, it's it's such a liberating, you know, kind of a, you know, uh, you know, uh, stage that we're in, so much more than you know back when you know. Uh, when, when when I was starting up in this space, right, where you you just got locked in and that was it, you know. Um, so it's, other, it's wonderful. Sorry. Yeah. But the other side of it, and I, I hear this uh, quite a bit, even in my consulting life, and now is that uh, because this we are spoiled for choice, uh, we can, we are also the, the scope of making a mistake is. Uh, is also larger, right? I mean, sure. how do you balance that? I mean, on one hand, there may be a technology that's been used for the last five years and, you know, it's stable, it's proven itself, but then here is this new thing, which is cutting edge, which can take you to a different level, but you don't know whether it will work, right? Or whether that will even be the industry standard. So how, do you get into these kind of discussions and how do you solve this problem between, say, stability and, you know, something that is cutting edge? Yeah, I'll start and obviously, uh, you know, Kavita and, and Bidisha, please add on. Um, but I, I think it, it, you said it earlier, right? You know, we, we talk about agile, right? You know, like it's kind of some formal, you know, whatever, but it's, it actually goes with the world we live in today, right? Because, you know, the, the key to, to what you just, uh, you know, the question you just posed is you have to kind of find out what doesn't work fast, right? So it's that notion of fail fast, right? So you know you, you want to you want you you definitely want to see if that great cool technology is 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 something you should use, right? But the the, the the you know the fact today is all of this stuff is you know you don't have to wait eighteen months to see the result of a particular trend you know project that you're kind of running, right? I mean you you know in two weeks, I mean that's what my clients always you know they they challenge me to say look. I need, I need a POC that tells me whether this is going to work or not in two weeks. That's it, right? If you can't show me that, you know, forget it, right? 
so so I think I think it's 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 that you know agile and and you know looking for ways to kind of do the different things, but understand you know which ones are the right one right things for you and understand that quickly, right? So over to Kavita and Bidisha. I'll take a stab at a lot of the things that have been discussed. So we've spoken about the importance of technology. We've spoken about the importance of people in the organization, culture, but the a very important part of the piece is the partner ecosystem. And just as it is important for us to have, and you know, I think we've crossed that stage where you have to have a digital team which sits outside of your marketing team or sits outside of your SBU. Uh, we're at a stage where um, firstly, every person has to be a digital person and you have to have them as part of your business teams, your, your tech team. It, 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 they can't be sitting as a separate vertical. Um, and now the beauty about the partner ecosystem is that they need us as much as we need them. So we've constantly got to uh, got to keep listening. But if you are seen as an organization which uh, experiments, which does new things, then people will come to you. You should try to be the first door that people knock. You know, uh, because uh, uh, all of us are, we are in the we've been in this industry for a while, and we know who are the sort of people who would like to experiment, and we know who are the sort of people who would be the companies that would be the last to do something uh, different, um, you know, last to take a punt at something. So you've got to try to be the sort of person that people will uh, be uh, will come and knock. Uh, they should knock in your at your door first. So you've got to build this whole culture. And it doesn't take a lot of money to experiment. So when it comes to marketing, uh, I, I remember when I was a young brand manager and it was my head of marketing who used to, because the easiest thing to do in those days was spend money on traditional media. You know, you would all, FMCG would always spend on TV. Uh, but we used to have, uh, we, we had to put in place certain metrics. And I think that comes back to what uh, Bidisha was saying that it became a KPI. You know, how much of your, did you spend at least 5% on experiments? Did you spend a certain amount on, on digital? And what did you learn? So you have to have a culture of experimentation and it does not take a lot. It doesn't take a lot of money to do that. Similarly, so when I'm talking about partner ecosystem, even in manufacturing and, and your partner ecosystem, oftentimes we meet people who will come and tell you that look, you've got to invest in, let's say, X, Y, Z without getting into specifics. And they're willing to do POCs uh, and, and, you know, work with you and say, look, I'll come and run this for you for a period in time. You, 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 it's just that they want to do a POC with you because once they've done it with you, then, uh, you know, they, it opens up maybe more business for them. So, so that's the way I see it. Be, uh, you have to have a culture of experimentation. It doesn't cost a lot of money and you've got to build a partner ecosystem and digital needs to sit within the SPU. It is not a separate team. Oh, that's, uh, it's a, Kavita great. mentioned uh, it doesn't take a lot of money about three times and trust me, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Diamond, that's loss of billing for you. I think. Yes. <laughs> yeah. no, but Kavita, you raise a very important point that even in academia right we have strategy and digital strategy we have marketing and digital marketing and i think eventually we need to break those silos there is no two different things yeah. it's it's all the same so great point Yudisha, sorry you wanted to add something. no uh, you know uh, i'm a i'm a customer to my technology team so when something doesn't work i throw it back at their face so i don't uh, you know I'm, <laughs> I'm a customer and i'm a, a very tough customer because uh, you know again small experiments uh you know uh, uh work and we know we know quickly right if something is because we are very clear, again like i go back to why are we doing this digital transformation not because it's fashionable because mm -hmm. it's it's solving a certain problem and you get tools you know to 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 solve that particular person and if, if it's working working if it's not working throw it back at at, at my my technology team and, and demand a better technology so uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a customer to them, so. Got it, thanks. So I, I think this is great. And we cover, we talked about people and we kind of spent some time on technology. I just wanted to cover one last topic. And I know Simon, it's really late in the night for you. So we will let you go in about five minutes, uh, which is data, right? <laughs> which I know Simon is your favorite topic as well. So, uh, so hopefully that should revive you. Uh, so just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, big data and especially the dark data side of it. Right? I mean, have we gone to the other extreme where we have so much of data that we really don't know what to do with it? I mean, do you see that? And is that also a burden for organizations that you have so much of data that, you know, it's a, it's costing you, but you're not really using it efficiently. And just wanted to 
get a sense of you know how much data is good enough data i can i can start with that because uh, i don't agree with what you said uh, for us uh, you know data uh, you know is the new oil or so to speak because uh, you know uh, for a b2b organization and i've worked in b2c's as well but especially for a b2b organization uh, the funnel is very very important you know and what comprises the funnel right and uh, uh, what set of data constitutes your top of the funnel versus what constitutes your bottom of the funnel etc so for us uh, not a single piece of data gets wasted i mean we data is uh, is is looked at uh, again you know uh, just like the way digital is not a business a specific business teams uh, uh, you know responsibility etc similarly with data um, you know we have of course we have data privacy rights etc but uh, uh, you know cxo and cxos n minus 1 all have are looking at the central database by which you know constitutes the funnel every day and every week we have data driven meetings saying i'm seeing that the top of the funnel is is stagnant it's not moving down um, you know and of course from that fund from that data comes marketing strategies am i going to do account based marketing you know because x percentage of the data says that um, you know we need we need to go deeper into that particular account or is is a particular segment maybe the hospital segment today we are saying i don't have enough data i don't have enough people uh, for my organization to call on so uh, then i need to do a lead generation activity to make sure that i top up the funnel right so for us uh, every single data is uh, viewed there's an actionability to every single data cohorts are made uh, uh, to drive business decisions So uh, again, Vidisha, it's just a point of view. So I'm not agreeing or disagreeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I recently re- yeah. written an article about called frugal data, right? So that's my mm. new term on this. So I just want to get a sense of whether I'm being a unrealistic academic or uh, is there actually some sense in this whole concept of uh, frugal data? Uh, Simon, like yeah, that? no, I, I think you know today you know, you're right. I mean, there is we we've, we've gone to you know one extreme from. structured you know sql where you knew every piece of data that in, you know you 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 know but that was not exciting because if you knew all the data you you know there's a limited set of outcomes and and insights you're going to get from it right i mean the exciting thing about today is you don't actually know all the data that you have right and so the outcome you you're going to achieve or the insight you're going to gain from you know utilizing that data can actually be something completely unexpected right so so it, it's powerful but at the same time i think you know it, it's it's okay to not know attributes of your you know your products or you know or or the customer behavior or whatever but when it comes to the data related to the core of your business right um you know the 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 core of how your business your, your business runs the really key thing today is knowing your data knowing where it is which is the gold standard right so so the you know the old fashioned notion of um, you know master data management mdm right is coming right back in the in the cloud world right and it's coming back in the form of data governance right so it's the it's the you know the buzz now in in you know it's it's the the, the need to kind of know where your data comes from and which data is is useful for which purpose right and then being able to utilize that data in in the in a proper safe and you know and secure way right okay kavita anything you'd like to add from your perspective in terms of you know is there too much of data now and have we gone to the other extreme uh, kavita sorry no i think I, no no i think i i echo what my fellow panelists have said that uh, in fact you, you often find that you don't have enough data you'll come up with like, let's say a question and say oh how is it that after uh, you know having access to just so much data you need to now get this as well um so so you, so yeah there's there's uh, the key things that simon spoke about which is knowing uh, while there's a lot of data knowing which are the metrics that you're going to be tracking regularly and um, reading data again is an art knowing what you're going to otherwise you can just get lost in the data but 
uh, it guides quick decision making. It improves uh, the way you do business. And so yeah, I have nothing further to add. Okay, great. So it's not just the quantity of data, but also the quality of data, I guess, in the sense that you could have a lot of data, but it's not relevant, then it's of no use. Yep. So great. Uh, uh, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, it's I, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure uh, our audience has uh, learned a lot as well. Uh, you represent very different industries, uh, but uh, what what was very interesting, but not surprising, is that I think your viewpoints are very very similar on what transformation is, and it's about creating value for the customers. Uh, I think the other thing that all of you vehemently agreed was that digital is no longer an option. Uh, in fact, if you haven't started your journey, you're lost. So uh, you should have already been down that. Uh, some tips for companies is you know, start small. Uh, don't try and change the entire thing overnight. Uh, you know, get your backend as well as your customer processes uh, in place. Uh, you know, be agile, build up, use an ecosystem, a partner ecosystem to experiment with a lot of new ideas. Uh, and uh, and really, you know, keep going at it. It's not and build a culture uh, which will support uh, uh, change and agility, uh, because this is not a one-time process. This digital transformation is not a project. It's it's going to be around for a long time. So with that, uh, uh, I'd like to close the panel. So uh, Simon, Bidisha, Kavita, thank you very much for your time. I, I mean, this has been absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, really appreciate uh, all the candid uh, thoughts that uh, you shared with us. So on behalf of uh, Professor Jannat Shah, the director of IIM Udaipur, the faculty, students, and alumni, uh, we like to appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Too. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Time. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.